started. Welcome to the 2016 Wilderness Issues Lecture Series. This year's title is What's the Wild Worth? The Price of Nature's Amenities Through a 21st Century Conservation Lens. The lecture series has been running for over 20 years here at the University of Montana. It's brought to you by the Wilderness Institute, which is housed within the College of Forestry and Conservation. It's available for credit to students at the University of Montana. But as always, it's also open to the public, and so we welcome anyone to come and participate in the lecture series. So each year, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the process, we choose a theme for the lecture series, centered on some uh, natural resource issue, discussion, or story that's currently of interest to a broad audience. Um, choosing this year's theme, as I hinted to students last week when we met prior to the first lecture, was no short order. Uh, of interest um, in this topic, myself and others discussed uh, what type of topic we could bring about that would have something to do with valuation of natural resources. Not being an economist, I have no first-hand knowledge of the issues, techniques, research, and many of the stories associated with the economics of public lands, values, and resources. However, as a researcher, a practitioner, and now an educator, I acknowledge the important role that economics plays in all aspects of natural resource management, uh, policy, and conservation. And so I, along with the students and the public who come to these lectures throughout the semester, look very forward to learning a lot because this is a topic I'm really excited to learn a lot more about as well. Um, at first glance, it may seem for those that have come to the lecture series for a number of years that we're somehow straying from our typical discussion thread of wilderness issues in our society. However, I think we're quickly going to learn from the speakers in this year's lecture series that economics plays a very vital role and quite pivotal role in how we as societies make decisions that become foundations of our value systems including wilderness in all of its facets. These value systems translate to geographies like national parks. They translate into actions like reintroductions of native species. And in some cases, these decisions will become policies that form our intergenerational legacies on the landscapes that we find important and imperative to our ways of living. I'm not going to wax poetic anymore during the course of this lecture series. I'm going to leave the rest of the story to the experts. Tonight, we are going to begin with Dr. John Duffield. John was born and raised in Montana. Since receiving his economics PhD from Yale in 1974, John has taught and conducted research in the Department of Economics and the Department of Mathematical Sciences here at the University of Montana. His work has focused on the development and application of methods for valuing non-market resources and services. These would include fish, wildlife, water, and natural environments. Over the years, he has worked on a wide range of natural resource issues, including air pollution, coal severance tax, endangered species, and in-stream flow. Among other projects, he was the lead economist on the Wolf Recovery Project in Yellowstone National Park. On behalf of federal, state, and tribal trustees, he served as an expert witness in a number of landmark environmental cases, such as the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Arco versus Montana, which many of you may know as the Clark Fork Superfund case. Montrust 1 and 2, which was a fair market value um, for Montana School Trust Lands case. And most recently, the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Tonight's talk by John is titled, Valuing Ecosystem Services to Inform Natural Resource Policy and Management. John will be speaking to us about his experiences and ideas of how values can be used to inform natural resource policies and decision-making processes. He's going to showcase a number of examples that illustrate how his pursuit of economics has made a difference throughout many environmental cases and causes across the country. With that, I would like to open our lecture series for the season and welcome Dr. Duffield to the podium. Wow, it's green. How's the sound? And I know the visuals aren't that great. I crashed and burned in a ski race this weekend. <laughs> she was there. <laughs> Oscar 50K up in Sealy. Um, yeah, I, I ended up at Yale and 
did a thesis on wilderness, if you could imagine. Uh, my colleagues, there were only about 15 of us in our class, uh, went on to a little bit different things like monetary policy. One of the ladies that uh, I benefited from her lecture notes is now the head of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, maybe you know her. Another one of my actual classmates and a good friend has just finished serving as the longest serving president of the Yale University. So I'm working out of a closet in Montana, Missoula, Montana. A little different life, but it's the one I figured. Uh, I was interested in wilderness, and I was emotionally prepared to be you know, an obscure academic, which maybe I am really. Um, but there were a few changes since the time I went to school in terms of uh, like a sea change in environmental values in this country. And it's in large part reflected in uh, environmental laws that have been enacted in the last 50 years. And along with that has been a huge evolution in uh, the tools that economists use to value, uh, quote, non-market resources, things that aren't changed in markets like clean air, clean water, uh, wildlife, fish, water resources to a large extent. And so it's, you know, I've kind of been along on that ride. Um, so I guess what I kind of saw happening when I, when I first came back to Montana was uh, that economics meant extractive resources that had market values. People built dams because they could value the hydroelectricity. They didn't value the salmon, like Grand Coulee uh, shut the door. You know, on a pretty big salmon fishery, the, the big June hogs went extinct and so on. Um, if there was land and you could mine it, there was values there that are easy to see, and maybe you couldn't see any value to open space or wilderness uh, and so on. So what my work has been has been kind of trying to level the playing field. So to somebody, there's a big decision Somebody's be able to come in on one side and say, this is worth X dollars, which unfortunately is something that in this society we pay attention to. Uh, it might be nice if there was a, a valid and accurate estimate of what you might be losing on the other side when you go ahead and do something like dam a river, uh, kill off a species, et cetera. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the story I'm going to try to do tonight. And I've got more slides than we can handle, so we'll see how far we get. But uh, you'll see my structure here in a minute. This is uh, one of the projects I worked on for many years. About, I've done about 20 years of research in Yellowstone beginning in the late 1980s. Um, but this is kind of a benign view of, of wolves, you might say, kind of like an ecosystem. They fit in. It looks happy. Uh, and some people might feel that way about them. And then some people might feel this way about them. This might be the little red riding hood look. <laughs> you know, there's the, the houses and the civilization. And there's this dark force. Both of these, by the way, do you guys know Monty Dolak? He's the local, local artist. Both, he's, he's the guy who did both these pieces of art. Um, Anyway, that's the dichotomy that we often face in environmental issues and decisions. And it's something that, to an extent, you know, economics can play a role in. Um, so this is, uh, this is my plan. We'll see how we stick to it. Um, I'm going to just kind of get out some introductory ideas that I think are foundational to understanding this stuff and talk a little bit about the legal and policy context. You know, very important is the whole set of environmental laws that have been passed in the last 50 years that kind of give you something to anchor your arguments in. Uh, like if you want to protect, uh, I don't know, Kootenai River white sturgeon or piping plover or bay checker spot butterflies in Santa Cruz, all of which I've worked on. Uh, it's kind of handy to have the Endangered Species Act, you know, because you're usually working with an attorney in a lot of cases or it's legal argument, so that that framework is really key that we've, we've made those milestones. I mean, it's part of our 
social compact. It's our, it's our agreement of how we're going to do things. And then I'll talk a little bit about tools. We could just peer into that pretty deep, but get across the basic idea of, you know, how do you do this? Uh, and then I think the best way to do that, I'll go kind of light on the tools and just zip through some, some cases that I'm, I've been working on. I've done a lot of work over the years on water resources. Um, started out kind of trying to stop some dams like Kootenai Falls, Auburn Dam in the, uh, on the Sacramento American system, Salt Caves on the Klamath, and uh, have come around to now where we're starting to take dams out. I've worked on uh, work at taking the Elwha Dam out of Olympic National Park, recovering the first big western dam to come down. Um, and now we're working on the Klamath, which some of you might know something about. Anyway, there's a story there. And um, then the terrestrial case, the wolf things, sometimes interesting to people. And then right now I'm working on the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. It's a big EIS on managing Glen Canyon Dam which for better or worse uh, holds back Lake Powell at the head of Grand Canyon National Park and that incredible 250-mile uh, whitewater wilderness float. You know, it takes you 15 to 18 days. So anyway, it's interesting. You know, there's the hydropower, and they can maximize their revenue by operating it like a, to a flush toilet, uh, which is to say load following, so they shut the dam off essentially at night and put a minimum flow of maybe 3,000 CFS. And in the morning, they ramp it up to 25,000 when they turn the toasters on in LA. And uh, <clears throat> that's a bad time to be on a boat. <laughs> and then we got a story up in Bristol Bay about this uh, big gold mine up there. It's proposed pebble mine. So anyway, there's a lot of different things we could do. So where I'm kind of going to go with this is that actually this thing of trying to value environmental resources has, has been important in a lot of big decisions. Uh, sometimes it's sensitive to like the spatial definition, like is this about Montana or is it about Oregon in the case of the Malheur? Or are we talking about, you know, is this a national issue? Are there national values? And what if you take account of them? And then... Uh, Things are really heterogeneous that differs from case to case. A day of fishing on the lower Missouri, uh, looking for some, I don't know what, uh, suckers or something, versus you know a day on the upper Missouri on the Madison. The, those aren't the same experience, and they aren't the same resource, and then, so they have different values. Um, anyway, so that's kind of where we'll head. Um, in this country, a lot of fish and wildlife resources, which are or natural environments, the services of natural environments, include these aspects, uh, which parenthetically, if you were going to try to do an application to, say, a wilderness decision, you would probably look at the bundle of services that that wilderness provides. It would probably include fish and wildlife, recreation, and so on, uh, watershed. Uh, Anyway, it's kind of an ac historical accident that fish and wildlife are, uh, quote, non-market. In this country, ownership of fish and wildlife goes with the states, um, whereas, you know, I lived in Norway for a year back in the 80s and uh, wanted to go fish the river uh, where my grandmother grew up, and it was leased to some guy in Paris for the next 10 years. I mean, there the ownership of fishing rights go with the land. So, uh, you know, if it was over here, we'd have uh, a lot of fee fisheries. And we got a few, you know, there's some spring cricks in Montana. Uh, some of you know, like Nelson Spring Creek down in the Paradise, uh, south of Livingston. So we've got a few of those. And last time I looked, they're $100, $150 a day per rod. Um, you know, a really top salmon river in Scotland or Norway can be upward of 500 to 1,000 a day. Of course, we've got a good exchange rate now. Now's the time to go. It's not that much money. <laughs> anyway, we got better fishing in Alaska. Uh, another kind of thing about it, just to comment, there's such a thing as pure public goods. It's kind of a little bit of economic jargon that some things, you, you can't establish markets. I mean, fishing, you can put a fence around that creek or you can put a fence around Yellowstone. 
I mean, they have entrances in Yellowstone Park, so you could, you could turn it into a market resource, somebody could own it, and they could be profit maximizing, and they probably wouldn't be charging $10 a car for a week, right? It had, we've actually estimated what would be the profit maximizing entry price. I mean, if you make it too high, nobody comes. Too low, you can make more money. Well, last time we looked at it, it's around $350 to $400, which may sound outlandish, but you know, a lot of people are spending two or three thousand dollars to get there with their RV from I don't know Poughkeepsie or Miami. I mean, it's it's a big deal for a lot of people uh, to go to Yellowstone. Anyway, there's those kinds of things that have direct use. We'll present this more formally in a second here, but there are some things that are quote non-excludable. You can't put a fence around them, like clean air clean water, they're sort of transitory, migratory waterfall. Um, people usually give the example, well anyway, that's one aspect. Another thing that some things, additional users don't add any cost, so the efficient thing is the public to do it. And like sometimes, you know, like you look around, the public bridges and roads are usually public ownership. And the point is, once the bridge up, I mean, whether you got five people walking across it or a thousand, you know, until the bridge starts falling apart, there's no really no reason to charge unless you know you're just trying to make money off people. Same with uh, you know the argument for having some public utilities, this whole mountain water thing that's going on. So there's there's some things where it really makes sense for them to be public, and so you got to figure out some other way to come up with values that a market. And there's another jargon, market failure. And if we don't take account of the value of these things that aren't exchanged in markets, when we do something like dam a river or you know, kill off a fishery, uh, you're making a mistake because maybe the fishery is more valuable than the dam. And we're starting to see this reversing some old decisions. It's probably true on the Klamath. It's definitely true on the Elwha. Uh, there may be a lot of rivers like that. Uh, the Columbia River, it's incredible, you know, the fishery that was lost there. Anyway, so that's, that's that. This is uh, just a little picture. Another key aspect of doing this kind of work is that economists are like totally dependent on the state of the science. Um, so you've got to have your biologists, your hydrogeologists, your geophysicists, uh, whatever the problem is to tell you about what's the, what's the physical engine, this natural environment and how do, how do things change. Uh, th those things generate some kind of set of goods and services, elk populations, kind and type of fish, um, and so on. And they generate the values that people derive. I talked about these direct things like fishing, where you could put a fence around it. Um, you, you can think about consumptive, you, you know, you're hunting. I just talked to a friend that got an elk yesterday you know, this uh, game damage hunt, there's consumptive use. <laughs> uh, but there's also, you know, like watching things, watchable wildlife, and indirect things like uh, irrigation where the water may just be recirculated. Uh, the big difference in these sets of things are these so-called non-use values, and those are, are of the nature of a public good. Uh, and an example of that is, uh, you know, you, maybe you guys get these mailings, say, from the National Wildlife Federation. It's, uh, you know, save the pandas in China or something, or uh, wh whatever the species is. And, you know, a lot of those end up in the trash, but some people make donations. I've made some donations. Maybe you have. And that's a real economic commitment. You're putting money. What's the chance you're going to see a panda in China? So there's things that people care about, like maybe wilderness, in some cases, natural environments, clean water, uh, welfare of other peoples. Uh, and one, has, one way to label that motive is so-called existence value, that you care, you just care that something is alive out there. And how do you exclude people from that, from knowing that? You can't. So it's a, kind of a public good. It's difficult to value. Um, another one is this bequest motive. I do a lot of work with tribes. And often that's very strong uh, is, you know, the next generation. Let's have it, you know, for the next generation. So anyway, that's kind of a bit of a taxonomy. 
And it's relevant because the way you can tackle use values is different than non-use. So this will become a little clear. Uh, this is just another tabulation of that basic point, uh, direct, use, indirect. And there's methods that go with each of those. And this thing that was called non-use in the prior slide, another word for it's passive use. You know, it's not direct. It's not on site. Um, and parenthetically, that thing, uh, that, that diagram was out of a great uh, kind of a primer on this whole area. The National Academy of Sciences uh, did a panel and wrote a book on it. And it's, it's basically valuing ecosystem services. So if you want to dive into this stuff, that'd be a nice place to start. It's what, you know, top scientists in the country put together. Now, this is, the, this is the framework I was talking about. Uh, Wilderness Act passed the year I graduated from high school. Um, this was Clean Air Act amendments that were very important, but the original act was 1963, so it was really the first one. And like the trade-off there was, uh, you know, the science end there the, that economists worked with were epidemiologists. Uh, noticed that uh, X and so uh, parts per million of sulfur dioxide you dose people with that. You get this many to the hospital. Uh, you know, that's morbidity. And this many more people die. That's mortality. Uh, you put a value on health. You put a value on human life, which people do. Uh, they do it in, in damages, accident cases. I mean, anyway, we won't get into that stuff. But the point is that the Clean Air Act uh, kind of provided a focus for cleaning up uh, situations where the impact on the public what was causing a greater cost to society than the cost of putting on you know, scrubbers and so on. And we're having that same fight right now in the context of you know, the Obama's clean air amendments and the death of the coal industry in Montana. And you guys have probably been reading about that. Yeah? Is there really been no other significant? Oh, no. This is like my off the top of my head sampler in the two hours and 27 minutes I had to prepare for this. So no way. <laughs> and this is actually my personal list because I've, I've had contracts and grants. I mean, I've, I'm at the University of Montana, but I only made it as a tenured professor for about 15 years. And I was just much more, I like to teach, but I was much more interested in doing research and kind of getting things to happen. And that's the way my life went. I mean, about the time I was, you know, 15, 20 years into teaching, uh, that's when they passed, you know, CERCLA, especially this natural resource damage stuff. The Clark Fork thing started to heat up. You know, I could see these oil spills coming. I, I was just really interested in it because I felt I could really make a difference. So anyway, um, I ended up starting a business. I call it bioeconomics. And every year we have the last bioeconomics Christmas party because we don't expect to be in business the next year. And then you get another phone call, and this guy's in Manitoba, and he's got a huge bison ranch, and they're putting a power line through him. That was the phone call last month. You never know what's going to come across the table. So it's, it's been kind of fun. Um, anyway, uh, NEPA, EISs, we worked on so many EISs, especially in Yellowstone. There was just an article on the paper on the new quiet snowmobiles and you know how the snowmobiles have dropped about 25 percent and the snow coaches up and the environment in winter environment at Old Faithful is much more attractive. I made some people mad, some people happy. You know, we quantified the arguments. Um, Clean Water Act. Uh, boy, we worked on a lot of things there, but this is. It's, I think, the 401C section uh, that has stopped some mountaintop mining removals is what the Obama administration is looking at and maybe stopping this pebble mine. Uh, if you're interested in that one, just Google pebble mine. You'll find out a lot of stuff on it. Uh, but that's, that's a Clean Water Act. It's hung up in court. We've, we're done with the studies. Um, Endangered Species Act, that's the whole wolf recovery stuff. Not to mention these other things we've worked on. We did the bull trout critical habitat, the Columbian, the Klamath. There's been a lot of work. And then CERCLA, uh, that was the Clark Fork Superfund case. I'm not going to get into that in detail, but the science there was you got 100 years of mining in Butte. 
uh, toxic metals in the Clark Fork, uh, on the fishery side. How do you prove as a biologist what's happened? You find these guys chose to use control sites, so they find you know ge geologically and geomorphically similar streams, and look at how many fish are alive in them and then check out Silver Bowl Creek that didn't even have bugs in it. <laughs> you know, not even caddis flies, mayflies, stone flies, whatever. And on down the river, it improved so distance from Butte. And it figured out that, that uh, it was about one-sixth the fish population, and then we can put that into our models. And I think we came up with like something like 80 million in damages for recreation. And we worked on groundwater, you know, had to work with, you know, the size of the aquifer, what it costs to drill wells, all this kind of stuff. But under CERCLA for the Clark Fork case, I think we ended up getting about 470 million. We just finished uh, doing a Superfund Oil Pollution Act case for, we happened to get hired by the state of Alabama and the BP Deepwater Horizon, and we just got them 2.3 billion. The lawyers just said the other day we could start talking about it because this is, you know, they finally settled. And we said, oh, can we, can we say that's all? We were responsible for all 2.3 billion, which is a lot of money. Uh, they said, well, that's what the other guys are saying. I, I think there were about three of us that were, you know, the leads on it. But anyway, it's kind of neat to get involved in that stuff. And the Oil Pollution Act, Exxon, and so on. Anyway, so that kind of motivate some of this. We've done tons of work in Montana. Um, I'm going to just go to these examples. Um, I think the reason that economics makes a difference in these settings, I kind of made the offhand comment that people pay attention to dollars in this society, but, but that there, I think it's at its basis a way to say it is economists should be able to tell you does this particular action, say putting wolves in Yellowstone, not damming a river or damming a river, putting a mine in or not putting a mine in, does it make society better off or worse off? You know, can you answer that question? That's, that's kind of an efficiency argument. So if you're lobbying in front of a judge or in a legislature and you can go on and say, hey, this, this project is going to cost our society $327 million, and it's only going to get 50 million in benefits, or you know, this thing, whichever way the facts fall. So that that's a powerful argument in our society because otherwise you're just wasting money. People don't like to do that, but that's not the only answer. So a lot, you know, economics just and that's one that that's the main thing we can answer. But another aspect is it fair? There might be something that kind of makes economic sense, but maybe it's going to make uh, you know the poorest people in society or some you know trodden on minority worse off. Do you really want to do that? And so one thing economists can tell you is who's benefiting and who's losing. So it, it allows you to answer questions of you know equity of fairness, and that's a big deal. And one of the ways we get at that is that people are often kind of interested in the people that live around a site and what it's going to do to their economic livelihoods. So this thing's benefit cost analysis, but another very different thing we sometimes do is, quote, regional economic impact, like how many jobs going to lose, how's that play out. So often we'll be doing both kinds of studies. Um, and I can, I'll, when we get down to the wolf thing, I'll give you a quick example, and that might be as far as we'll get. And then finally, you know, is it ethical? Does it, does it match our morals? Is it something, you know, that's right? Uh, and when I think of the Endangered Species Act, to me, that's like a moral statement. It's kind of like, thou shalt not make a species extinct. So it's kind of like outside economics. There is a clause in there that you're supposed to weigh the benefits and costs of designating critical habitat. And we do that, but uh, you know, there's some things we decide on ethical grounds. And so I think political argument is, you know, on the way you get traction in whatever venue you're in, in court, uh, before a legislature, trying to influence a city council, whatever you're doing, these are 
if you look at what people are saying, you can usually classify them like this. Definitely in the wolf thing, we could go through that one and make the arguments. Um, you know, did, did the wolves, do the benefits of wolves, are they greater than the cost? Is, is it unfair to some significant part of the society? Like, is it going to destroy the, I don't know, the economy around Yellowstone? Or what about ranchers? Some of those ranchers are going to really get nailed. Is that fair? Is that justify if there's some benefit? And then, you know, ethically, well, why are we doing this in the first place? Those kinds of arguments of, uh, you know, they're an endangered species. We should recognize other species on Earth, and so on and so forth. So you can see how that plays out. And as economists, we're, you know, pretty humble because people always disagree with us. Uh, but we try to do it as accurately as we can, give error bounds, do careful work, and then, then it just goes into the mill with everything else, and everything else is usually about fairness and ethical. And in a lot of cases, this wasn't even done. So, um, so this, this kind of lays out a little clearer what I was just saying, maybe that you know, there's these efficiency arguments, and so we apply these kinds of things, benefit cost, which is a whole kind of t set of tools. And I'll give you some examples of the benefit side. Uh, equities, this regional economics is typically what we do, or you know, a tabulation of who, the losers and the gainers. And then the ethics is kind of out beyond us, but it's definitely there. This is like your tersest possible slide on methods uh, for direct use, like let's imagine fishing or visiting Yellowstone Park, or going to see wolves. Um, in some cases, you can get market data. Like I said, there's fee fisheries. You can get information from entrance fees and how people in Yellowstone have reacted to increases. Like we're just getting around to increases in park, and you can look at how demand drops and construct demand curves like you would for carrots or whatever. But they're usually so low, just nominal prices for, for national parks. Most of them are free anyway. Um, another way is this whole bag of things called revealed preference. And that is that you can sometimes infer from how people behave in certain related markets, you can infer values. And this was an insight of this uh, Harvard economist back in the late 40s. And it really wasn't worked out until like the 50s, 60s. So it hasn't been around that long. But there, at this point, there have been thousands and thousands of these travel cost studies. And, We've done a bunch of them in Montana. It's the basic idea. If you, you stood at the gate of Yellowstone or on the Madison, you looked who's there. Now, there's going to be some people from New York because the salmon flies are out or whatever. I mean, it's, it's famous. But most of the people are going to be from the close places, you know, as a per capita, say. They're going to be from Bozeman, a few lesser per capita from Billings. You get out the Dakotas, Wisconsin, Chicago. New York, Miami, they're there, but you know, vastly reduced uh, numbers. And so you can kind of look at travel cost as a spatial price that allocates use. And you can use that information. You can plot how use drops off with distance. And then if you, you think you know what the travel cost is per mile, IRS thinks they know. We you know, measure these things. Uh, it kind of looks like the demand curve for carrots. When things cost more, there's fewer people. And so you, you can, if you can believe that people would react to an increase in a site fee or a site fee at all, the way they react to increasing travel costs, how use drops off, you can just construct a de demand curve as if there was a gate around the place and you were charging market prices. So that was pretty fast, but that's the idea. And then there's a, that's a single site, so-called zonal travel cost. And there's a much more complicated way to do it, is to take a multi-site, use the same idea, and put it in a multinomial logit formulation. And that got this guy, Daniel McFadden from Berkeley, his Nobel Prize. So I'm not going to try to explain it here. But we've used it plenty. We used it in the Clark Fork case, because he was on the other side working for ARCO. And, uh, we build our own, and then we argued about it. But in the years since, like, we just use their model in cases against mining companies. 
because Arco Bill, it must be good, McFadden's behind it. I mean, our biggest fear going to trial was that McFadden was going to get his Nobel laureate before we went to trial. Don't want to go up against the Nobel laureate, right? Uh, what's your credentials? Well, I, I live at the Un University of Montana. I'm, I'm educated. Anyway, um, so we, we actually use it in this great case, speaking of how you need your science. I don't know if you guys heard of Mike Horse up the Blackfoot. It was a tailings dam, historic mine above Lincoln. And there was a tailings dam failure mid-70s. Well, you got to be lucky because you know, you don't have data everywhere you want it. But it just happened that this guy, Leiter Spence, uh, who I knew from working with Fish Life and Parks on a number of in-stream flow issues, happened to sample cutthroat populations below Mike Horace in the upper Blackfoot. And then the Tangley Dam went out, wiped them out. So we had a perfect set of data on the loss of that cutthroat population. And then we just used ARCO's million dollar model and ran it with, you know, how's that, how's fishery use and what's the cost to anglers of blowing out that fishery? And it came up because it was so many years worth, it wasn't that many people, um, but it came up to $37 million. And we ran the model for, you know, pennies and they got it out of, uh, this was a Sarko on that one. We got it out of a bankruptcy judge down in Houston and that's what's, moving all those big trucks up in the Blackfoot right now. So you got to be lucky on some of these, especially with the science, that somebody will have done it and figured it out. I mean, one of the big things right now is climate change. Uh, so, you know, the arguments on that science, it's pretty heated. Anyway, that, that's revealed preference. You can observe people. And then this thing, stated preference, is a huge category of things where Oh, you want to know what something's worth to somebody? Well, why don't you just ask them? I mean, that's kind of the naive way to put it. Uh, it was this guy, uh, Robert Davis. I've met him. Uh, he finished his PhD at Harvard a couple years before I started graduate school. I read his thesis. And he wanted to value Baxter State Park in Maine. It's, you guys know Mount Katahdin, first place the sun hits. You from Maine? Yeah? <laughs> All right. Anyway, it's a cool place, so he wanted to do a kind of a wilderness economic study of the value of it. And so he, he did a you know, so-called contingent valuation. You know, give me a valuation-related answer contingent on what I'm going to ask you. And so he asked people, you know, it, it's hard to answer the question, well, what's the most you would pay, bef you know, to go into Baxter State Park, say? I mean, that's almost impossible to answer, but you could probably... Well, the way he came up with was, well, what if you had to drive an extra 10 miles, would you still have made this trip? And then he asked a separate sample, well, what if you had, had to drive an extra 30 miles? And so on. And so he, it kind of like using the travel cross formulation, but asking them. And this thing is now, there have been thousands of studies, and it's something you can do to value passive use, where now you can ask it in the context of, uh, you know, what would you pay to have X and so happen? Clean up this, get water controls in the Grand Canyon. And actually, one of my students here uh, wanted to value open space in the North Hills in Missoula. And we saw that there was going to be a, a refer, you know, an actual bond vote, a referendum in Missoula on a, like a $60 million proposal that would raise the average house price $120, you know, your property tax. And so, we got out, went around, did surveys, which in this field, by the way, you got to do survey research and get your own data, which makes it fun. Um, he went out and some people, he said, gosh, what if there was a vote on a, not a 60 million, but let's say a $30 million bond vote and it was going to raise your taxes $60 or whatever, correct it for the house you're talking to. And how many people say yes? So way more people would say yes to 30 than would for the, what the real vote was going to be. And then he asked some people, what if it was going to go up $200? And then he plotted that thing, and then they had the vote. And, you know, he was right on. He perfectly predicted what the vote would be. And so you can use things like that. That's actually what uh, there was a set of Nobel laureates that studied this whole thing of can you trust contingent value for big issues like, say, uh, Deepwater Horizon? 
And they said yes, and the way to do it is to ask referendums, set it up as a referendum. So we actually did one in Alabama. We had people vote on an increase in the tax, gas tax, uh, in exchange for a quicker cleanup of their beaches. And never saw the light of day. <laughs> they didn't, didn't use it. We didn't go to trial. We were able to settle. So anyway, that's another way to do it. I think I'll just do this stuff and maybe not get too far into the, the applications. And just mention another way to do it is sometimes you can look at the values of assets and infer an environmental value. Like a classic is what about the value of a lake or clean water? Uh, like if you've got a data set, which we've done this, of uh, real estate values around Flathead Lake, you got the values, you know, what the houses cost right on the lake, you know, how many rooms they are, correct for all that kind of stuff. And then you got the houses a couple hundred feet off, 300 feet off, half mile away, 10 miles away. And then you, you know, take, do a statistical analysis of all the things that might explain that house price like the size of it, when it was built, have they got 23 bathrooms, you know, what kind of place is this? Uh, do they expect me to live in this thing? Um, anyway, and then you throw in how close is it to the lake. And, you know, voila, you got a, if you get a, a statistically significant parameter on proximity to the lake, you can infer the value of the lake. And one of my friends, uh, Kevin Boyle, did this on a set of lakes in Maine and he was able to get an estimate on different levels of pollution in the lake, you know, and how clear the water was and so on. So anyway, that's another way you can do it. You can do that with labor markets too, like pe how people choose jobs. Like I understand that people come and teach at the University of Montana at low wages because of their, quote, second paycheck. They take it out in ski days at Snowball, elk hunting, <laughs> you know, fishing. I mean, that's and people that do that kind of thing, clean air, you can get a data set of people's wages for the same skill level and, and estimate the marginal value of access to ski areas, clean air, lack of crime. And so you, you can use assets too. That's another whole set of ideas. And we actually use this to value subsistence use in Alaska by looking at the choices people made to live in those villages in terms of the trade-off of, wow, is this hunting, fishing, and subsistence heaven? But, oh well, don't make much money. Uh, whereas, you know, there's other places like, let's go to Anchorage, you know, you can't shoot anything, but at least you get a better wage. Anyway, that, when you got a data set of three or 400 villages, you might see something there. And so we, we, we use this in uh, some of our Alaska work. I figure I got seven minutes here. So we're, I'm going to just kind of show you some pictures now so we can all relax, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to skip over a bunch of data, but here's just a quick application. This is one that was fun. We did this a long time ago. Uh, would you still have made this trip? We talked to a bunch of Montana anglers. We asked them a whole bunch of different prices. Some people said, you know, what if it was five bucks more? Would you have made this trip? Whoa, 92% yes. I guess so. What about you know the bids in this range? Almost nobody. So somewhere in there is like an average value. And one way to look at it would be this might be the median right about in here. Looks like it's about you know sixteen dollars. I mean you know measure central tendency fifty percent above and fifty percent below. You could also compute means from the statistical distribution and all that stuff, but it gives you a value. Um, you can plot it, you can fit it, uh, you can test the income elasticity. I mean, does it, are richer people more likely to say yes? You know, test that statistically. Uh, that's what you need as an equation, right? Um, anyway, this was the results across, you know, these incredible fisheries like the Madison. This is $1988. Uh, we also did a travel cost, and they were in very close agreement. The Spearman correlation was about 0.9. So they're totally independent data sets you know, totally independent studies and methods, and they lined up pretty good uh, in a lot of cases. Where's the upper flathead, lower Missouri? Uh, so it's kind of like what you'd expect. It's not surprising. It's like the range of variation I saw in Norway across fisheries. Yeah, I didn't get to fish the Lardal. I ended up on the Nordelva <laughs> out of Trondheim, and I had a good time and caught some salmon, so that was fine. 
But anyway, so there's a huge difference in the value across Montana fisheries. Um, and then we did some work on in-stream flow. Um, you know, there's some stuff about, you know, fitting this as a model for the bitterroot. I just wanted to point out that we have the salmon fly hatch in there, and it had a positive and statistically significant effect on whether people went fishing that day. But the point of it, I mean, I thought that was interesting, is how, how it responded to flow. And so we got some really strong results. This is a student of mine from Sunburst. Now she's back up there teaching economics. Anyway, so you can get marginal values. Um, you can plot them. So there's kind of a, you know, a sweet spot here where you got enough water, but you're not like trying, hoping you aren't going to die on the big hole down around Divide. <laughs> you know, that one corner you can't get past. Um, and the big hole's way more valuable. It's a bigger, bigger river that time of year. And uh, you know, there's a lot more people on it. Nowadays, the bitter root might be right back up there. But this, this is a long time ago. And you get marginal values. And then you can compare them to things like hydroelectricity and irrigation. And we use this in, a, in some studies. Anyway, um, we actually use it in a, in a water rights case. And this is kind of a big deal in Montana when people start talking about in-stream flows and leasing. I mean, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting, right? And that was the case. I mean, it was just like mob scenes in Helena when they started talking about this in 89. Uh, but anyway, we got invited to participate in a thing where a couple hundred irrigation districts had proposed additional withdrawals out of the Missouri. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks hired us to try to figure out the value of keeping the water in stream for fisheries. And then, by the way, we picked up the hydro values because more water going through the turbines downriver. Anyway, we, oh my gosh, what was this? Well, the floating wasn't too good that day. Uh, that's a buddy on the Smith. I missed that trip. Anyway, this is an example of, you know, like that legal framework we're talking about. The Montana law, often you'll see this thing, is it in the public interest? And sometimes, depending on what's happening, you talk with the lawyers when you're sizing up a case, that can be an opening for doing benefit cost. And this one, the language kind of supported it. So we did a benefit cost, and we used a contingent valuation, and you know the judge went for it. And so that, I think, was one of the first times that particular tool had ever been accepted in a court. Um, anyway, those are some different values. Uh, I, I can get too deep into this thing, but maybe I missed the punchline here. But yeah, the main thing was that depending on assumptions about hydropower value uh, and the return flow, uh, anywhere from only 2 out of 218 to 60 out of 160 would, would pass benefit cost test for the irrigation withdrawal. And so the board actually gave in-stream flow a higher priority. So none of these other irrigation diversions ever happened because they aren't going to do it because they'll be challenged in low flow years, which happen every year, it seems like. So anyway, it was kind of a big deal in Montana to get, get this stuff used in a water rights case. Um, so this is the wolf one. We've done a lot of work down there, like on you know, designating Dome Mountain value for the elk winter range. Does that outweigh the cattle? You know, what's the impact on the economy? We did, did a lot of that stuff. Uh, the thing about Yellowstone is everybody thinks about the geysers, but, but wildlife is the really big thing there. Most people are, just about everybody's going there. We did this study, we did early studies in the 90s, and then we did a study in 2005, kind of, hey, how do we do projecting this stuff? And we did park visitors, and then we went out to the, quote, American Serengeti, you know, the Lamar, where it's wide open and easy to see the wolves, you see the bison out there. I mean, it's, kind of your Lewis and Clark, Charlie Russell sort of view, supposedly. Um, anyway, wildlife viewing's a huge deal, and photography. And I thought, and the foundation of all this economic stuff we do um, is people, do people really have preferences for these things? Do they really care about these sort of fine details of the environment and what's out there? And that, this was kind of amazing to us. Uh, we decided to ask people what the top three sp animal kinds of animals they wanted to see on their trip to Yellowstone. And these were huge samples randomly selected at the park entrance stations. 
and we, 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 you know, we had data on where they're from, so we got out of state, and then residents are Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, that three state. And it's amazing, well, the grizzly is on top, uh, you know, they're going for the charismatic megafauna heavy on the carnivores. And we asked them about wolves, this was before wolves, and they're down there. But it's, it's kind of amazing, eagle, eagle, lion, these are like totally different populations. We're the, we're the wildlife experts, right? We live here. Um, but, you know, we got the same preferences as the guys from New York. So it was kind of interesting, I thought. And, and we looked at the stability of it over time, and it's, it's incredibly stable. So it's, anyway, I thought it was, kind of tells you that, you know, if people think that, um, that, you know, the environment's just the environment, it's all the same. People really have well-defined, really strong and stable preferences. That's kind of a big deal for economists. You know, and you can say, well, we did a study and we found this. It's not going to be probably different next year. So anyway, um, there's a bunch of interesting data on how the states differed on overall favor of pose. So maybe you do get the impression that Idaho's a little more down on walls. Uh, you know, that was showing up way back then. I, I got a bunch of this preference deal, kind of skipped through it. But uh, anyway, let's show you one other slide or two here. This is the, this is the passive use. Uh, where is our, yeah, so this was our overall benefit cost. The, the pretty small, like $10, $15 per household we got out of People saying they'd pay to help wolves recover in Yellowstone. Uh, you know, when it's over a national population, you get huge numbers. Uh, so these are thousands of dollars. So, you know, those are millions. Uh, we quantified the, the loss to hunters, you know, 200 to 500,000. And that was based on what we expected the changes in the populations. Uh, the livestock loss stake was generated by range scientists, livestock specialists, looked up in Alberta, Riding Mountain Park, you know, a bunch of places around Canada where there were, there were wolves and cattle in range and made these predictions. And so, it, like, you know, the, the benefits blew it away. When you look at it from a national standpoint and you include um, passive use, this is the equity thing was that still there was tremendous opposition from ranchers. And that's because they were going to, you know, most of the costs are going to fall on them. And it might just fall on a few specific families. So Defenders of Wildlife saw that coming and stepped in to take care of the equity arguments by setting up this wolf compensation fund. This guy, Hank Fisher, maybe some of you know him. Um, anyway, so that was what was going on there. And that's, you know, they paid out some money and it was right around in what we predicted for costs. I mean, it turns out the livestock costs are trivial. The hunting, foregone hunting is way larger. But all of those are dwarfed by, you know, the ecotourism stuff is basically a story. Uh, hunting has really dropped off. That northern Elfstone herd's coming back. Uh, the biologists down there, science question, they're kind of arguing over how much of it's drought, how much of it's wolves so on. So I don't know where it's at right now. Um, but, you know, what was predicted in the EIS for 10 years out is awfully close to what was seen. The management's costing more, uh, but things are, things are right in there. So it was, we felt like we did a pretty good job. This is another kind of equities look at it. Uh, regional, the region, you know, the three-state region, got the bulk of the costs and relatively low benefit because the benefits are a per person kind of thing. There's not many of us. So if you looked at Yellowstone as a regional asset in the way that some people have been looking at the Malheur uh, National Wildlife Refuge as a possibly local or regional asset, uh, what might be the best thing to do from an efficiency standpoint is really different when you, when you look at the fact that Yellowstone is like a national resource. I mean, it's it's nationally prominent and so on. So that's just, you know, makes you aware of sort of how the cost of benefits fall and might explain a lot of it. Glen Canyon, great place, Grand Canyon. 
That was the last time my wife was still speaking to me. We flipped in that one. Um, anyway, there's another one. We don't have time to go through it. I'm going to do questions, but I'll show you some quick pictures. This is the Grand Canyon. This is where you're thinking you're going to die at 45, 50,000 CFS. Your values drop off a little, I guess. This is the sweet spot around 25, 30. And down here, there's too many rocks. You can't even get down the river. So, but anyway, it came out of an economic study, you know, one of those contingent valuation. This was the passive. And this was, this stuff's really old now. Uh, it was last done, you know, 15, 25 years ago. And we just, like two weeks ago, dropped 4,600 surveys in a national sample. So we're getting to do this stuff again. We got, that's National Park Service and uh, Reclamation funding that through the U. And then we also got funding from USGS to revisit uh, the, uh, anyway, revisit the whitewater. This is sometimes the kind of data we get Oh, where is it? I guess we, you know, sometimes you got existing data. This is water levels and use in the two biggest reservoirs in the United States, Mead and Powell, what it does, regional economics. This is Bristol Bay, commercial fishing, this huge special place the size of Wisconsin. It's the, one of the last remaining viable fisheries in the world. You know, our fisheries are just one collapse after another. And this is the world's biggest sockeye district. And also, the Quijaco is the biggest uh, sockeye fishery. And it's also the Nushigak is the biggest king salmon fishery. It's about 60% of total US sockeye. So it's, it's a really special place. It's totally unroaded. Just fly in, fly out. It's 95% natives. Um, and there's proposed a world-class copper gold mine right at the headwaters of the Nushigak and Quijack where they come together. And so Clean Water Act, is this as bad as a mountaintop mining removal? You know, what are the values? Um, anyway, it's tied up in court, but we did a bunch of studies on this and got to, uh, we went up and stayed in some of these lodges up there. You might like to do it, it's only 7,000 a week a person. Uh, that's because you got a, your own float plane out there at the dock. and. You know, it's a super high end. But I go up there a lot, but I just got my own boat and hire a bush pilot. And it doesn't cost you hardly anything. It's just, you might die, I suppose. But <laughs> anyway, we did this stuff. It's pretty special. That's, you know, that's the villages. And uh, it's an incredible place. You know, we're pretty proud of the fact that we, you know, shoot a few elk and eat a few huckleberries. Uh, these guys are eating like 70 or 80 different things. One I liked best was herring roe on kelp. That's having your caviar with fresh seaweed, you know, right out of the ocean. Uh, anyway, you know, they're eating all kinds of grasses and bulbs and um, anyway. Uh, it's a really, really interesting economy. Uh, this is all they got, 7,000 people in a place the size of Wisconsin. So, uh, so uh, the miners are planning to build a half mile high tailings dam and they claim it'll never fail. And it's a seismically active area, of course. It's Alaska. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> so there you have it. I don't think I have anything else. Yay, it's over. Stay there. Well, I've, I violated our agreement, didn't I? No, it's okay. Oh, good. <laughs> so. I have a question to start it off. For, okay. For your, for some of these examples that you've given, who, who is off, often hiring you for this? So like with Bristol Bay, are you being hired by the state of Alaska or the EPA? Yeah, yeah, we work for, uh, EPA hired a big contractor called NatureServe. How's that for the name of your consulting company? So we were, we're the economics team. We're split between here and University of Alaska. And so, yeah, it's EPA money. We were working for EPA. But 
six, seven years ago, I, started, I did a study for uh, Trout Unlimited up there. So we actually started doing the fishery. Trout Unlimited wanted us to do it. So we were already kind of partway down the road, and then we'd done a lot of work for Alaska Fish and Game over the years. And uh, we also got some money from the Alaska Conservation Fund. Anyway, so, but typically, we, we're, we're working on public resources for the public. Now, there's another set of economists out there that tend to work for the potentially responsible party, the PRP, the mining company, the hydroelectric, whatever. I mean, we do hydroelectric economics also. We, you know, we did a huge case for the state not too long ago on claiming that we should get rents for state school trust lands in the stream beds. We own the stream beds. And that's by the, quote, equal footing doctrine. You guys probably all know your constitution inside and out. So we got admitted on the same grounds as the first 13. Anyway, the state went after it. We got them $6 million a year out of uh, Vista. Uh, used to be Washington Water Power for the dams on the, they, they finally settled. You know, they thought we had a good enough theory. And uh, PPNL fought it all the way. The district court agreed with us. And then they went to the Supreme Court. We had two different cases in the Supreme Court at once at that case. Um, and they got, got it overturned on navigation. They noticed that you can't navigate a waterfall. Very astute. And so now the state's waiting to go back and make just a claim for the reservoir acreage. And that hasn't happened yet. So, but anyway, we tend to work for tribal, state, federal trustees. Um, we worked for all the public land management agencies. Right now we're on contracts. I mentioned Park Service. We work for USGS, Grand Canyon Research Monitoring out of Flagstaff. Um, work for a few party, private parties, but we're, we're usually representing the public side, you know, either state or federal. Um, sometimes we're crosswise. Like one time we uh, got hired by the Ohio Attorney General, um, the Atomic Energy Commission, our federal government, cited uh, one of the early uh, uranium processing plants over the sole source aquifer for some little city out there, Cincinnati, I think it was. So not a good idea. So they polluted this huge, incredibly valuable aquifer with just radionuclides. It won't kill you right away. Um, so I guess we got the biggest settlement ever against the Department of Energy. So we don't work for them anymore. <laughs> no, just we're mostly BIA, you know, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Park, Park Service has really been our main thing for our academic work. And then litigation, it's usually the states and the tribes. We've worked for the Penobscot tribe on a dioxin pollution case in the Penobscot and Maine. We just finished working for the Hopi on uh, the other snow bowl, Arizona snow bowl. Uh, the, the ski place wanted to use uh, uh, sewage water, re recycled sewage water to make snow. And this was offensive to the Hopi who view these peaks as, you know, sacred. And they go up there and get their spruce boughs and take them down to their kivas. And they're, they're part of this, you know, still going incredibly complex religious cycle that they do. And so anyway, we just get involved in all kinds of crazy stuff. One time we worked for the Quashan or Yuma out of Arizona. And it was a power line, Western Area Power Administration. And they destroyed some of their geoglyphs, you know, the stone arch you see on the ground, like the running man. Anyway, you never know what's going to, what the next phone call is going to be. Yeah. Um, as far as the Clean Water Act, uh, you gave the example of uh, the mine here in Montana that uh, took out the trout population. Right. And then with uh, the Copper River Mine in Alaska. With, um, with like the one in Alaska training into the ocean and the one here being in freshwater, like how does that affect, and then also this different species of fish, does that affect um, the, the case at all? Well, you know, the, it probably affects the science end, but, you know, just, just one sort of pragmatic thing is those, when you've got, when you've got a connection to salt water and, and you're kicking it up into anadromous, fish, you know, salmon running from the ocean, 
uh, where, where you've got way, way more fish than like a resident population could ever support, it kind of kicks the whole level of the value of the fishery up like so many notches. Um, that, you know, that's sort of the, the obvious thing I notice. And then the thing in Bristol Bay is to put a mine where they're talking, it's not like, you know, okay, let's, let's do another mine in the Blackfoot so you drive up 200 and, you know, put a road in for half a mile down to the river or something. I mean, up there, there's no roads and there's no power infrastructure. So you'd be, to get to it, you'd be putting a road in and crossing, you know, the place is just laced with incredible rivers and water. It just, just the transportation corridor costs would be huge, you know, impact, say. So I, I think that's part of it. And the Alaska thing, it's just the scale of it. I mean, you don't, there's nothing left down here where you've got something that big. Uh, I mean, we're, we're down to our last wilderness places and, you know, even like the Bob Marshall, it's not that big. I mean, it's kind of big if you walk across it. <laughs> or I skied across it one time, that took about six days. <laughs> Come out at Holland, start over on the Augusta side, but one time I walked from Lincoln up to Essex, that took 28 days on one load of food, just seeing the country eating berries and fish, whatever. Um, anyway, I, I'd say that'd be a difference. I don't know if you'd have a comment. I, I, was, I was kind of thinking, um, sorry, with the trout, and um, they're kind of, they kind of stay in the river, and um, like the salmon, they you know, go in and spawn and then leave and everything. I didn't know, you know the way, like the lifestyles of the fish and um, would affect it, and then, um, as far as how how the uh, how it's draining, I mean, it goes to the ocean too much. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's not like if it was going to run into flooded lake, like yeah. we worked on those proposed coal mines up the North Fork. And yeah, another thing about it that's kind of interesting is that uh, you know these high-end guys that are that were flying at these lodges, you know, that are paying six or seven thousand. I mean, that's just that's just the motel, right? I mean. That's not getting there. So these are pretty pricey trips. They're pretty serious. And they're actually after the rainbows. They're kind of bored with the salmon. And the thing about those rainbows, they are so big. And it's because they're eating salmon eggs and salmon flesh. So there's kind of an interaction there between the, the, the salt and the ra resident rainbows, you know, due to that huge influx of uh, what the food does. There's a it's really kind of interesting, all the biology up there. There's a guy uh, that we worked with at the University of Washington named Dan Schindler. And he wrote an incredible paper a couple years ago. It got published in Nature. I don't know if you, any of you guys are biologists or whatever. That's a pretty top journal. And it was on, uh, <clears throat> there's a thing in economics and finance called the, the portfolio effect. And it's just that, you know, you don't want to buy, put all your money into Exxon, especially this last couple of months with oil prices dropping. You want to spread your risk a little bit, right? And so you have a portfolio, you know, a set of, set of investments. And that spreads risk, and, and you can prove that that's the most efficient way to go. It's kind of like how the market usually beats just about anything you can pick. But anyway, <clears throat> he got the idea to use that tool and look at, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff in biology about how species diversity leads to stability. You know, if you got a rich ecosystem, things kind of balance out. Well, he was trying to make the argument for population diversity. And the idea was that that is such a huge network of, like there's, Bristol Bay is huge. They've got five major rivers, uh, including the Nushigak, Quijak, Lagnac, and so on. And they're all very different, Mulchatna, Chilkadratna. Uh, there's 200 distinct populations, not different species. They're all sockeye. But they're all like micro adapted to their own little niche. Like some of them come into the river with more oil in their system so they can run further up, things like that. Um, some of them are, you know, they're mostly lake spawners. Some of them maybe the estuaries. I mean, it's, it's all really different. And he showed 
uh, the population var variability, given that diversity, um, that you would have, if, if, if it was a homogeneous fishery and they were all out of one river, you'd have 10 times as many fishery closers, you know, they really watch the stocks, um, cuts the variability in half. So in other words, he, he proved that the stability of that system, which is one of the things that makes it special, besides it's huge, is, uh, is just that this, they have this diversity. So, I mean, you think of the Quijack as like this incredible fishery. Um, it goes into Lake Ilioana, which is the biggest freshwater west of somewhere. And it's, it's like one of the only lakes in the world, I think Lake Baikal in Russia is the other one, that has freshwater seals. I mean, it's big enough to support seals. And it's really a special lake. And so it's an incredible system. But there's years where the sockeye run out of the Quijack drops to really low. But, you know, odds are that's years the Nishigak, the Lagnac, the other rivers are up. And so it's, it's really an interesting paper if you guys are at all into this. And, and that's what is kind of fun about this uh, environmental economics, natural resource economics, ecological economics, whatever you want to call it, is that interface with the natural science. Because, you know, it's, you got to work with people. And I meant to say at the start of my talk, I, you know, I had three names up there. It was me. And then my, my partners, research partners, I've worked with the same people here for 25, 30 years. And one of them is Chris Neer, does all our computational work and database management, just keeps everything straight, very bright guy. And then the, the key guy is this guy, Dave Patterson. I don't know if any of you guys have taken some statistics courses. That's why I'm in math, because in my field, we don't get our data off, you know, the stock ticker or whatever. We've got to go out and collect our data because nobody else, know, you know, the only people that know what's going on are the, are the users. And so we're, you know, right now we've got four really complex surveys going on this Grand Canyon National. We've got a sample frame of uh, Grand Canyon whitewater boaters. Uh, I think we're doing a couple thousand of those. And then we did an intercept. Uh, survey on site with Arizona Fish and Game to capture the tailwater fishery at Glen Canyon. You know, that's a trophy rainbow fishery. Trophy rainbows, that's bad for the humpback chub, <laughs> you know, complicated. Um, and then we're also, we're hired by the Park Service, Forest Service, BLM, this coalition to, you guys ever buy one of these national parks passes? I've got mine in my pocket because it cost me $10 because I'm so old. And it's for the rest of my life for any park. I mean, it's incredible. But they bank on old people for getting their pass, so I've, I've had to buy a couple of them. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so they're, they've never known where these people are using their pass, you know, when you get this lands pass. Like, are they mostly at the Park Service, or the Forest Service is saying, well, they're mostly at our sites and BLM. So we're doing a survey to settle this issue. It's not a, not a big, you know, it's, it's interesting work, you know, designing surveys and working with statisticians to get your sample. And then it's Christmas. Right now, my mailbox in math, it just, every day you see, we got our first passive use survey back today for the Grand Canyon. And we started that, trying to get that thing approved in 2009. I just, I mean, it's so tough to get surveys through the federal government right now. Anyway, there's people that don't want to know the answers. <laughs> I think that's what's going on. Or maybe it's just obfuscation, red tape, whatever. Yeah? Of the environmental degradation that you and your partners, cases that you and your partners get hired for, how many are preemptive and how many are calculating like stipends for damage done? Uh, oh, OK. So like in advance of something getting built kind of thing, is that preemptive, would you say? Are you an attorney or? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I would have ever come up with that word. That's a good one. Um, yeah, I'd say, you know, it's pretty rare, actually, that we get these in advance kind of things, okay. tell you the truth. It's more something's happening. Well, like this newest thing, the, the power line through the Bison Ranch. I, I mean, in a way, that's kind of like, can we stop it sort of thing? But, but typically, it's 
it's almost more of an environmental justice thing. Something's happened, especially our work with tribes, and we're just trying to make things right. You know, kind of the polluter pays principle, you know, it seems to be a fairness ethic. I mean, it's certainly embodied in the Superfund and Oil Pollution Act and so on. So I'd, I'd say most of our stuff is like damage is done, you know, but. Do you think that this valuation of natural lands would have like this kind of work about a time to stop the total mine? Well, you know what? Uh, EPA has already made a judgment. And, you know, it's, it's actually in a really interesting case, but it's, it's not one where we can see, you know, the, the actual language in the laws is, is really key. You know, like the way I kind of showed you that one on the water rights case. Mm -hmm. See, I always, the lawyers will say, well, you got to do this. And we always read it ourselves because they don't know what ideas we might have, but but the Bristol Bay, the language is is kind of like if this action will have a significant I'm just kind of roughly paraphrased significant impact on clean water or fisheries. So what significant mean? Uh, then then it's within the power of whoever Secretary of Interior, which means the president. I mean, it's a big deal to you know, not, not open it to permitting. And so the science is so strong on this one. Wow, they got huge significant impacts. You know, what, what it's going to do, the likelihood of spills, all this stuff. So it's, it's undoubtedly significant. So it, it's already clear. They've already, it's already clear from the, the report, which you can look up online. Just Google uh, uh, EPA Pebble Mine or whatever. Um, but, and, and then it's kind of like the economics is to the side. They just wanted us to be able to say something about how valuable it was, like this $1.5 billion fishery. So it's not trivial. Because this is a mine where they're talking about the reserves, or I can't remember what numbers you, they're using, like $120 billion. Of course, that's gross. That's not after you look at the costs and the reclamation and the loss, you know, whatever. But um, anyway, that, that's how I read that one. So it was, well, <clears throat> you know, it's just, I think what's going on is, is the mining company is, this Pebble Partnership is dropping a bunch of money. Like the big players, Anglo-American, have bailed. They're, they're, they pulled out of it. So it's, you know, it's getting smaller and smaller investors and people are bailing ship. They can see it's kind of almost a lost cause. This is, huge investment to get it to happen, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And, uh, but they're, these guys are fighting a legal angle now of, well, we got to, we're claiming that EPA was unduly influenced by, I don't know, Trial Unlimited or somebody, you know, they, they've been interviewing all of us, taking subpoenas and all this stuff. And everybody thinks it's, that's not going anywhere, but somebody had mentioned there might be a presidential election coming up. And there's a possibility. Is there a party that's less favorable to the environment? I can't remember how that works. <laughs> I, don't, I don't read the papers. There, wasn't there a vote in Indiana or somewhere last night? <laughs> Illinois, whatever. So, <laughs> you know, I think that's the game they're playing. Yeah. Why not wait till November 2016? So, well, who knows? You know, I mean, everybody plays every angle, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Any, any any other questions or? Yeah. Yeah, one for you. Um, do you considering the. At least you I, should probably answer this. <laughs> I feel like the population of valuing ecosystem services is increasing. I mean, maybe with the methods improving and our ability to quantify all these different benefits. And when you're looking at the larger context of public land management, do you think? that puts wilderness at a disadvantage when you compare it to other multiple use, maybe like, you know, non forest service non-wilderness, even when you go look at more dominant use, like, a, like the National Park, where you can actually access some of these resources more easily. Like the yeah. You know, I think that that's, I think, you know, kind of my take on that would be that I think wilderness values are probably heavy on the non-use or passive use. 
Whereas obviously the national parks, I mean, you got three million people going to Yellowstone. I, I think we estimated just from what we can prove as a minimum value per trip, that it's probably like a $1.5 billion asset. You know, if you were gonna buy it and you thought you could price people, I mean, it would never happen. But it's a really valuable asset. Whereas even like, you know, this the flagship, you know, the Bob Marshall or, or even the missions or whatever, um, I mean, by definition, wilderness is about solitude. Y you know, you're, you're not going to win the game counting backpackers. You know, so it's, it's, I think it's about, it's about what are the values, do, as a nation, do we value this thing the way that we value pandas in China or wolves in, I don't know, central Idaho, somewhere where their people aren't going. And for better or worse, that passive use value thing is a harder sell. I mean, if you can point to people, you can point to expenditures, and the passive use thing, it's still kind of a tough sell, I think. I give you a rumor on that one. Um, we, we were dying to see the BP case go to trial because we had heard that NOAA, federal government, spent about $45 million on their passive use value thing for the loss in the Gulf of Mexico. I, I would love to have seen what it is. I know a lot of it is they're not doing a random mail survey like we are in the Grand Canyon. I mean, we're doing a, I don't know, our final budget on that is six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. I mean, it's a pretty big study, all this whole suite of studies. But $46 million, you know what they're doing? They're doing a national random sample with in-person interviews. I mean, you're not mailing out a you know a dollar twenty envelope and a postcard reminder, second mailing, follow up phone survey, where you can get by ten, fifteen bucks. I mean, ten bucks won't buy you lunch for trying to get to the town where these people are. So you quickly this thing goes crazy. And you've got not just, you know, a couple of PhDs and a raft of psychologists designing the survey and pre-testing it, and focus groups. Uh, I think I personally knew about 20 people working on it that were all four or 500 bucks an hour. And I think they spent more than two hours a piece. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this guy, Dan McFadden, that eventually got the Nobel laureate. Um, my understanding is that he is now owns a really nice uh, winery and wine ranch somewhere in <laughs> Sonoma. Yeah, and that was the Clark Fork case, you know. So somebody was telling me there was uh, some guy doing work kind of like we do, 1,500 bucks an hour. Um, I can't remember if that's what our rates are right now, but uh, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> All right, thank you, John. Yeah.